Hey everybody, James from Love My Pups and MyBuddhistSupply.com. This is our weekly uh, answer some questions. We've got some questions in, so we're going to go through these. Okay, um, I have a question about rare colors. Uh, uh, I'm new to breeding English Bulldogs. Uh, I purchased a lilac tri male with good bloodlines and a blue with tan points. Uh, what do you do with the puppies you can't sell? Do you keep marking their prices down? until they're sold, or is that flooding the market? Thanks for the help. Okay, so, I mean, we don't sell a lot of puppies, we're more in the stud business. We do have a few litters every year, so we do run into this situation. So, so I would say to this, um, the first thing is, um, you know, be honest about your puppies, show great pictures, which means taking a lot of pictures. Uh, for me, uh, videos that I then put through YouTube work really well, because it lets people not only see the puppy as a single picture, but it lets you see the puppy moving around. You can talk about the puppy as it's doing, doing this, and you can do you know, five, 10 minute videos. So to me, that's probably one of the most useful ways of letting people know what kind of puppies you have is to do videos along with photographs. Now, start advertising and putting your uh, information out about your puppies early. Don't do it when they're eight, nine, 10 weeks old because people want puppies, they don't want older dogs. So I would get try to get people interested in adopting one of your uh, uh, puppies um, making a commitment to that sooner than later. So you put a price on it and you know you need to look and see what prices are selling for for those dogs in your area or wherever you're advertising. And, and don't get you know, crazy on prices because if you do, you're probably not gonna sell any puppies. But if you're not selling puppies, what do you do? Well, the answer is, is you mark the price down. This is a supply and demand thing. So, so I, can, I can promise you this, if you do or don't sell your puppies, you aren't gonna make a lick of difference to the whole marketplace. The whole marketplace for Frenchies these days is absolutely huge. There's, if you go to places like puppyfind.com, you'll see you know, 3,000 puppies that are for sale right now. 3,000 puppies that are for sale right now. So, so part of this is how do you differentiate yourself from other people? Well, quality of your, of your puppies is obviously one thing, uh, and also, to a certain extent, the way that you market your puppies, how receptive you are to your buyers, that you can answer their questions in a timely manner, that you have some, some sensible way that you can uh, um, get puppies to your customers, that you have a contract that makes sense. You know, those are all things that affect it. But, but if you're not selling the puppies, then you've got to do one of two things. Market it a different way, market it in a different place, or drop the price. Because if you don't sell the puppies, then obviously you're going to have an infestation of Frenchies in your house. Not necessarily a bad thing, but I promise you, whether you do or don't, if you drop the price or not, you're not going to flood the market. That's already been done. All right, enough of that one. Okay, I have a, I have a Frenchie, my female puppy's lilac, chocolate and cream in her DNA. Well, that doesn't make sense what you say there because if she's a lilac, then she is both chocolate and blue. Uh, so I don't quite know what you mean there, but anyway, I'm going to assume that you mean that she's both a chocolate and blue dog because she's a lilac. So in order to get full suit lilacs, uh, what is the right color for the offspring? I think what they're asking me about is what should they breed the dog to? Okay, so remember, and by the way, I want to make a correction for the last video because I got some people who called me on this. So this is an example of, by the way, remember I'm not a vet. Um, and I absolutely can give you wrong information, not intentionally. If I do, I apologize, and if I've got wrong information, call me on it so that I can correct it. So I made a statement last time about Isabella, which I think is incorrect, and I made the statement that I thought that Isabella was basically testable chocolate. That apparently is not correct. Isabella is another name for lilac, is what I've been told, and that sounds reasonable. So, so what is a lilac? A lilac is a dog that is little b, little b, little d, little d. It is both a blue dog and a, uh, sorry, not right. it's both a chocolate dog and a blue dog. And I'm gonna bring up one other thing that somebody mentioned in a, a comment from my last one. They were, we were talking about chocolate. There's different forms of chocolate. There's testable chocolate, where you can run a test and it'll actually show you that it's little b, little b, which is pretty rare. And I call that Isabella incorrectly. Uh, and then there's most Frenchies uh, are non-testable. So they come back as Big B, Big B, but they have a red eye glow. All of these dogs that are true chocolates will have a red eye glow. In my experience, I have never ever seen a dog that was chocolate that didn't have a red eye glow. Um, 
And somebody also said, by the way, that Merrells, be careful, because Merrells that are not chocolate can have a red eye glow. I have a chocolate Merrell girl. She does have a red eye glow. And I have a chocolate and blue carrier Merrell <laughs> stud boy. He does not have a red eye glow. So I don't know about that Merrell part. About, or I can tell you this, all Merrells do not have a red eye glow. That I can guarantee. But whether or not uh, a Merrell can have a red eye glow and not be chocolate, I don't know. My experience on this is pretty limited, is they do have a red eye glow. If, they, if they're a chocolate, they don't have a red eye glow if they're not chocolate. Anyway, back to this. So this is the dog that you're trying to produce. The puppy needs to be a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Okay, so how can you get there? Well, the answer is, is both parents have to at least carry blue, chocolate, and blue to get a lilac dog. Because remember, um, this is the puppy we're trying to produce. And that, if, if one of the parents is this, then every time it gives that, cannot produce a lilac. So this parent has to at least be this. And it has to at least be this. Same thing goes on for the other parent. It has to at least be a chocolate carrier. And it needs to at least be a blue carrier. Because otherwise, you know, so what happens? So the answer is the time that you successfully get a lilac out of this is if this parent gives this blue gene, chocolate gene, and this blue gene, and this parent over here gives this chocolate gene, and this. Okay, that's a little bit confusing. Yeah, Can, is, would it be better to just show it in a Punnett square? Well, I can't do it in Punnett square on two different things is the problem. We can talk about them individually. But, but I want to keep on going on this, but Russ has got a good point here. So the, the problem here is if you have two dogs that are chocolate and, and blue carriers and you want to get a lilac out of it, you only get one in eight of the dogs going to be lilac. It's a pretty rough call. So you're much better off, much better off that you, if you breed, get rid of this rubbish. If you breed a dog that is, one of the parents is a lilac and the other parent is a lilac, then this dog every time has to give a chocolate gene, great. So there's the chocolate gene. This dog every time gives a chocolate gene. This dog every time gives a blue gene. This dog every time gives a blue gene. Guess what? You get a lilac every time. You get a complete litter of lilacs. So if you want to produce lilacs, the most reliable way to do it is to have a lilac married to another lilac. You get a litter of all lilacs every time, no questions asked. It absolutely has to happen. If you choose a dog that is a, um, only a carrier in one of the genes, then half the dogs end up being lilac. If the dog is only a carrier in, in both the blue and the chocolate, then only a quarter of them being lilac. And if both parents are only carriers, then only an eighth of them are lilac. So that may be a bit confusing, but that's probably the best I could do. I'm going to do another whole video on genetics because I've got lots of people who like the ones I did before and would like more information. So we will do more of this. But suffice to say, if you're trying to produce a lilac dog, then the way to get it done is to have two lilacs mated together, and you'll get it every time. If not, then the next choice is to have a lilac dog mated to a dog that is maybe a blue that carries chocolate or a chocolate that carries blue and half of it will be lilacs. So anything else, your number of lilacs you get gets pretty low. All right, okay, enough of that one. Uh, what do you feed your Frenchies? Do you give vitamins? Okay, I get lots of questions on this. There are so many different brands of food out there that we have used lots of foods over the years. Um, so these days we use a non-grain food uh, because we suspect that it might uh, make allergies worse. Frenchies can have allergies, grass allergies. We don't have a lot of problem with this, but at the same time, uh, we're not feeding a, um, a gra we're feeding a grain-free food. Right now, we're feeding uh, alpha dog uh, white fish is what we give our adults, um, and that seems to work very well. But you know, I don't even know if that's available in your area. There are so many different kinds of foods out there with all kinds of price ranges. Uh, I, I'm certainly not an expert in this, but I think that probably feeding a quality 
which means expensive food is probably the way to go. Vitamins, yes, we give pet taps. And we give, uh, we give um, something with folic acid in it to our pregnant moms too. I think that's a good thing to do. Um, you do that for human beings. Uh, women, when they get pregnant, are recommended they take folic acid, and so we do the same thing for our dogs. Um, and then one thing that we do as well is when our dogs are getting close to having puppies, um, we transition them to puppy food because it's got a bit more calories in it. I like to have a slightly fat dog not a skinny dog going into a pregnancy because a dog that has a litter of four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty puppies, they've got to produce milk, they get drawn down like crazy and they just start looking pretty rough. You can see their back burn after a few days and they just don't like it. And you can feed them as much as you physically can and you'll still see that problem. And we also use a product called Bill Jack. Um, and that works here. We use this product. Bill Jack, and that is a frozen, it's in a frozen food section at Walmart. Um, it is, um, do you have something there? What's that bag over there, Royal something? Oh, that's for, that's for a customer dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well Royal Canin, we used, to, we used to use Royal Canin like crazy, we don't use it so much now. Um, where was I? Bill Jack, yeah, it's in a frozen section at Walmart, it's a five pound bag, costs eight bucks. Uh, it, you thaw it out, it's a really, it's a soft food, the mamas really like it. We sprinkle some goat's milk, goat's, uh, some cottage cheese or some powdered goat's milk on top of it to give them more calcium. They'll scarf it up and we give them as much of that as they physically want to eat. We leave the bowl in there with their puppies 24-7 so they can have as much food as they want. Because you know they've got to produce milk, they need calories. They need calories to do that. Alright, so that's that one. Okay, next question. Bill Jack. Bill Jack is gone. Ruh, messy. Okay. Uh, okay, please do a video with more information on moles. I'm gonna do another whole video of genetics, so that one's not gonna to do today. I'm curious about the double A recessive black gene. I researched that and you can get different colors with that gene. What colors can you cross with that gene to create mutations of different colors? Okay, so we're talking, now I'm gonna talk Frenchies here, so other dogs, this is the agouti gene. This is the agouti gene. So there are, on the A gene, there's a possibility of RAY, which is responsible for fawn dogs. There is AT, which is responsible for tan point jaw dogs. There's A, which is the recessive black gene we're talking about. And there's one AW, the wild gene, not in, not in Frenchies, that's when you get the wolf pattern, that's the AW gene. Um, so t most Frenchies are AYAY, and if they don't have a copy of Brindle, they end up being forms. Uh, dogs that are ATAT or ATA that don't have Brindle end up being tan pointed dogs. So blue and tans, chocolate and tans, black and tans will all have that in their makeup, either one of those two. Dogs that are AA is, is a recessive gene, you have to have both copies to be, be in effect. Dogs that are AA are black, that's another way of getting a black Frenchie. Frenchie this, you can get a black Frenchie um, because of the KG, which is not present, I don't think, in Frenchies. So the only way you can get a truly black Frenchie is a dog that is double A recessive, and that will be a black Frenchie. No other color on it at all. But the other thing this does is the AG makes for a very uniform coat color. So if you put the AA with blue, DD, you get a very, very consistent, really beautiful blue coat. If you put it with a chocolate dog, then you get a very, very consistent blue coat, chocolate coat rather. And if you put it with an EE dog, which I have this dog, that, which is all of this together, then you get a very consistent uh, um, kind of a, a white cream color. I'm starting to see a pattern here. The AA recessive, Shouldn't that be two lowercase a's? Well, yeah, it can be drawn different ways. It does, I mean, a, a little, I mean, the answer is yes. Um, you're, you're probably right about that. It probably should be drawn, it should, all of these should probably be drawn like that. And that should be like that probably. But again, anytime you say a, a, you, you know, you, you can't have, there's no big a, little a. It's either a or it's not. But fair enough. All right, enough of that one. How many minutes have we into this for us? 14. Oh, well, we really got lots of questions to do still. Alrighty. Yeah, that was kind of uh, confusing to me when I was researching a little bit was 
they use the capital A for dominant and the yes. lowercase a for recessive? Well, there's, yes, but in, <clears throat> yeah, fair enough. I, I'm not going to add any more to that. You probably should call it little a, correct. But anytime you talk to dogs being a, a, there is no, it either has to be a, a, y, a, t, or a, w. So if, it, if someone says their dog is a, a, I don't care whether they put little a or big a, it's an a, a, double recessive dog. All right. Um, my girl is expecting a litter of two. She's healthy, good age, fed great, um, bred on the right time. Male is from a litter of seven, and she herself is from a litter of five. What would be the reason for this size of the litter? So she's asking about litter size. We've done a videos on this. We've mentioned it quite a bit, but let's just go through it here again. So what impacts litter size? Well, I think that there is some anecdotal evidence that if a dog comes from a large litter, female-wise, that maybe it produces more eggs like its mother did and it has capable of producing more puppies. But, but the reality of it is that when a dog um, ovulates, it produces a certain number of eggs and we don't have any control over what that is. Now there are some drugs that you, maybe you can give that might get more eggs out. We don't mess around with any of that stuff. But basically the job then is to do two things, get viable sperm there at the right time and get the timing right. So the big thing about this is the timing. And I suspect if you have a litter of two, your timing wasn't right. I know you say it was right. I don't know how you did your timing. Progesterone tests is the way to do it. AI on a progesterone level of 15, surgical on a level of 20, and check and make sure the numbers are staying up there. All right, that's that one. Next one. Hello, can you do a video on explaining the process of handling and inseminating ship semen? If you're not using a local style, or do you only recommend TCIs and surgicals on ship semen? Okay, so I've got a whole video, a number of them on this, so I'm, I, but I'm just, it gives me an opportunity to plug my product, so we're gonna do it. So we do a huge amount of ship semen all over the United States. I mean, literally, we send out as many as seven in a single day. We don't do that every day, but we will send out something in the order of five to 700 samples every year. We, this is our business, this is what we do. We have lots of really beautiful stud dogs, we've got 18 of them, uh, and, and we really have perfected this. And part of the process to be successful for us is this electronic shipping flask. And you can look at more information on that, I don't want to harp too much on our product right now. But this thing will keep semen viable for a trip that can last up to four days, and it will keep it exactly at five degrees centigrade. So you, you've got to collect from the dog correctly, you've got to put it with an extender that's been pre-warmed, you put it into the suitable shipping container. If you're using our product, you'll have great success. The customer gets it at the other end. When the customer gets it, they're going to have a, um, a world pack. Let's see. They will open this thing up. They'll open this up. Inside it, there'll be a world pack. The sample will be inside that. They then get a syringe and an AI rod. I don't know if we'll get one of those here. It'll come with a syringe. Not very organized here. It'll come with a syringe and an AI rod. Let's open one of these up. So basically, at the other end, they open the bag up, put this in, suck up the sample. No preparation needed. Go straight into the dog. Insemination is complete. Got a whole videos on how to do the insemination. Most of my customers do a vaginal insemination. Lots of them do it themselves. You certainly can do a TCI, transcervical insemination, where they take a scope and they go up inside the vulva into the vaginal canal and all the way into the cervix. You could do it. a surgical, where they put the dog under for a few minutes, make a slit in its belly, pull out one horn of the uterus and inject the horns of the uterus and inject the semen directly into it. Uh, they all work great. You don't have to do one or the other. So the comment about do you always do surgicals and TCIs? No, most of the time we do vaginals. Uh, what age do you start breeding your males at? So AKC says that you can use a male at seven months or older. Now my experience is that seven month old dogs are not gonna do much for you, but they may be humping around a little bit. So we start working with our dogs. The moment they start to show interest in other uh, females, that's the point that we start to try to collect from them probably every two weeks to start with and then we go to a weekly basis until we start to get something useful. So I've got a guy right now, uh, Sir Humpalot. He's new, he's like nine months old, he's online right now. 
Uh, but he, it took a, took a month to get him to the point where he was producing a little bit to his producing enough to inseminate a dog. So some dogs, it might be as late as a year. Some dogs, it might be as soon as eight months, but that's the typical kind of span for it. But you need to work at this. You need to make it a pleasurable experience. And that brings me to another video, another one that I got in this comment here. Male dogs do not vomit violently, violently when they impregnate a female the natural way. Uh, they, but they frequently do when they are masturbated by human hand. Uh, it's certainly not a, a pleasant sensation for them. Financially lucrative for the man, not so rewarding for the dog. Well, I call you on that. I know. Uh, so I can tell you this. The first thing is that Frenchies have a very hard time doing it naturally. If you try to breed dogs naturally, you may, you may have uh, semen on the ground and you may have exhausted dogs. We always AI. So when our dogs, when we pull from a dog, occasionally a dog who's just had food, it will throw that food up. It's not a violent vomit, it just like that and the foods come out of its stomach. And the reason for this, I suspect, is that in the wild, dogs that are actually going to mate with another dog, wolves or whatever, um, that they are very vulnerable uh, when they are in actually hooked up and they can be attacked by other predators. And so one of the things they don't want is a heavy load of food in their stomach that stops them from getting away quickly. So I suspect that that is the reason why some dogs vomit. And it's not, and I can also tell you this, that my dogs, when they see me come down with a cup, they do not shy away and go in a different direction. They are very, very happy to see me and very insistent that they're the dog that gets chosen for this particular process. So it is not an unpleasant process for them. I don't have any problems collecting for my dogs. Typically they will, they will start humping within literally a few seconds of being presented with a cup. Uh, and we do absolutely care about our dogs and we do try to treat them in the best possible way we possibly can. We are never cruel to them and that it is not, a, it's not an un, an, an, a not enjoyable experience. So that's an interesting fact too. I've noticed that uh, oftentimes your dogs don't even need a female to yes. do the job. They're so used to this. In fact, they might prefer to have me versus the female. That's exactly right. So typically what we do, especially on younger dogs, that we'll have a female. She may not even be in heat, but we have a female there. It's what we call a tease dog. And what we'll do is we'll keep that male away from the tease dog because it's not even in heat. We get, the, we get our male up on a table where we've got it working height, and then we immediately bring the female up. The moment you start sniffing on that female is the moment that we grab hold of him. And we don't masturbate, we just grip. All we do is grip his penis, and he gets bigger, and he will start doing this. He will start thrusting away for about, what do you think, Russ, a minute, minute maybe? And then he'll calm down. And it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a, a rodeo, isn't it? You've got this cup you're holding on here, and the dog's jumping around, and you want to make sure it all stays in the cup. But, uh, um, but yeah, a lot of my dogs, most of my dogs, you can go down there and just plonk them up on a the table. They know what's going to happen. They're happy about it. The moment you grab hold of them, man, they start ejaculating into a cup. Okay. Uh... My first breeding was just confirmed. Sire is 8080 and Dame is AW80. What colors can I expect from this litter? Okay. So now we do get to a part of this square. So here we go. So, we have, we're just talking about one gene here, we're talking about the A locus. So this dog is A-T-A-W, and the other dog is A-T-A-T. -A -T. And Russ pointed out he wanted to be using a little a, it really doesn't make any difference because an A-T dog, whether you write it this way or that way, it's exactly the same thing, so it doesn't matter. So I'm just going to write it that way. So what do you get? Right, so you get out of, you'll get these two pair together, you get an AT80 dog, tan point dog. This goes together, you get an ATAW dog. This goes together, you get an ATAT dog. And these ones go together, you get an ATAW dog. So the answer is, you half your dogs are going to be ATAT, tan points, and half the dogs are going to be ATAW. And I don't know about the wild gene, so I don't know what you get here. I don't know which one of these is dominant. That's not dominant. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know what you get. Sorry, can't help you on that part. I can tell you this, half the dog's gonna be tan points, but if they express the tan points, you can't have brindle present. So they've gotta be uh, NN on, the, on the, the, it can't be brindle. If you get any brindle in there, this doesn't work. Don't know about the AW. So, but the answer is, this is not to do with colors. This is to do with tan points and the wild, the wild wolf looking um, 
um, coloration. It's not the color, this is the tips of the, the tips of the hairs we're talking about. All right. 24 minutes. Okay. Uh, love your videos, James. My dog was tested. He ended up with E-M-E-M. -E -M. Capital E-M, capital E-M, that's a black mask. A-Y-A-T, which is one copy of 10 points. Big D, little d, which is blue carrier. Big B, big B, which is, let's just write this down. Sounds like a lot going on there. Yeah, it does. All right. Cleaner, a cleaner, cleaner. A bit rough. Okay, wow. Terry so, so their dog is, Big D, little D. What is that, Russ? Um, chocolate. Blue. Well, you got brown, blue, B. That's D, the dilution gene, which is blue. This, uh -huh. is, this is chocolate brown, which is the brown, chocolate gene. Uh, he is A Y A T. He is N S, which is to do with he's a pied carrier. Didn't tell us about the, the brindle gene. We don't know what's going on here. We need to know that to know what's going to happen here, really. So we don't know whether this dog is brindle or not. So we, we're missing one part. Okay. My dog has a red eye glow, but his dad is little b, little b. He won't produce chocolate, correct? No, he will. So you just made the statement that your dog was big b, big b, because it came back on a test. Fair enough. But it has a red eye glow. If it really has a red eye glow, and you, I've got videos on this of what it looks like. It really has red eye glow. And this dog, although it doesn't test, it is that. And if it is that, that dog will produce chocolate puppies if it is put with another dog that is either BB or BB. If it's this, half the dogs end up in chocolate because you get BBs and BBs. And if it's put with another chocolate dog, they are all that, all of them are chocolate. So the answer is that uh, that um, this dog has red eye glow, is chocolate, it'll produce chocolate puppies. If, he, if it's a blue carrier and you put it with a lilac, it would produce a litter of half chocolates and uh, half uh, chocolates that carry blue and half lilacs. Okay, what's how many minutes are we now? Anyone else think Merle's a really ugly colour? Okay, so you know what they say is that, is that the beauty is in the eye of the beholder or something like that. Look, I mean. There's people out there who think that those of us who are breeding these uh, uh, non-AKC showroom colors like uh, blues and chocolates and lilacs and murals are an absolute travesty and shouldn't be done and we should all be drug outside and shot. So, I mean, you know, if you don't like the murals, fair enough. I mean, you know, if you don't like redheads or you don't like blondes, fair enough. I mean, it's, you know, it's game. Um, but, but nobody responded to it, so I don't know. If you, if you like them, say it. If you don't like them, don't say it. We'll do a tally and we'll come up with a count. We'll see what the count is on it. Um, so we're almost done here. Uh, two we can more. make a questionnaire on our YouTube channel. Okay, we might do that. All right, which, what page on the internet can I go to to get color, color test, uh, DNA test? Well, the one I use is Animal Genetics out of Tallahassee, Florida. Um, they're very good. Uh, they have coupons every now and then. Typically, a complete color pa panel will cost you 130 bucks. When they have a coupon, they run typically twice a year or three times a year. Then it goes down to 95 bucks. You have to send off a DNA sample. That you can ask them for a free DNA swab kit. And you basically take that and rub a little brush on the inside of the mouth and, and collect the this, this sample that way. Uh, you can't do that in puppies that are nursing. You can clip a nail and make it bleed, or you can do, or you can. Uh, um, Clip nail, clip, um, do claws when you do claw puppies, you can send those off. Uh, it takes about a week for results. Very good, I like them. Uh, and here's the last one. Do you have any experience with ear hematoma? Can you please message me on this? Yes, I have seen this. So what happens is, is the dog, for whatever reason, bashes its ear and it gets a huge, great, big swollen up ear. Um, and the reason that it did this is, is probably because it had an ear infection in the yeast or ear mites, and it started shaking its head like crazy and started bashing its head onto something and then caused a blood vessel to break in its ear. This caused this hematoma. So you'll get this dog with this hugely swollen ear. And the, 
the fix for this that, that has worked for me is two things that you do. The first thing is you drain the blood off the ear. So you go get a syringe, a needle, a pretty big needle. Uh, a, a, I say a needle, I mean a needle that goes onto a uh, syringe, a fairly decent bore needle. You stick it in the margin of the ear. When I say the margin of the ear, I'm talking about, oh, we have 30 minutes yet for us? We're at 30 right now. Okay, listen. So here, this is the dog's ear. Here's the dog's head and here's the ear, right? What a terrible looking dog. So this thing is swelled up. You go on the edge of the ear where you've got this big mass. I'm just gonna draw the mass. It's, it's a big mass right there. So you come in with the needle on the side and you drain that out, squeeze the ear and get the ear flat. Then the next part of this is to go, if you don't do this next part, it just fills up with the air again. You go get something round like that plastic part and you take the ear and you take the ear and you put the ear around it and you wrap tape around it. And what that does is it stops blood going back in there, so it compresses the ear. You can't just fold the ear up, it doesn't work. But if you go get something that's round and you take the ear around it and then you take some tape and wrap it around it, that will probably fix it for you and the hematome will go away and it probably won't come back. But if the dog has an ear infection, you're gonna have to fix that. So go, go look in the dog's ears, see if it's stinky in there, go enlist a vet, go get some drops for ear mites, go get some drops for a yeast infection, whatever it is, get rid of the ear infection. All right, guys, um, here we are. If you've got questions, um, then you can email us, you can phone call us, and you can go to our website if you'd like to look at our studs. If you want to buy products from us, like our heated whelping system, our shipping containers, puppy kits, all of those things, then uh, there they are right there. Um, if you've got questions and I, you want to talk to me directly, absolutely do it. And then I've got one more thing. You can put me back on the on screen there if you would, Russ. One more thing is, um, People are asking about how do, what, what's our dog kennel set up. Well, we are about to build some new kennels because we're moving. And so I will put the plans up for that, show you exactly. I'm going to do a whole video on, I've got quite a bit of experience of this over the last 15 years. So I've built a number of kennels and I've got better every time. So hopefully this next one will be the very best one that we can do. And I also want to talk about this just really quickly. We've got a new product that we've been messing around with. Yeah. I'm not very organized here. Man. Come on, come out of there. Here we go. We've got a new product. We're not ready to sell it yet, but this is basically a heater. So this is a heater. There's actually some heat tape in here. It's run off 12 volts, so it's very safe. This gets bolted down to the floor. And this gives you a really nice, uniform, heated area for your dog to lay on. What do you look for, Russ? Uh, something to put up against the side to show how thick that is. That's some really, that's it's strong a, material. It's, a, it's an aluminum plate that is completely, the dog cannot, this is one that's been used, the dog cannot tear this thing up. They can tear up the power cord, and that's what we've been working on for the last nine months, is to come up with a correct way to get a power cord that works. The good thing about it is it's 12 volts. So even if a dog does chew this thing up, they cannot get hurt, which is very, very important. So it's not live 110 volts. This gets bolted down to the floor, and what I find in the winter time is that all of my doggies are just laying on top of one of this, just feeling great. So it's just a nice warm area for them. So that product will be available for this winter. We are still getting the kind of final touches on it. I don't even know what the price is gonna be yet, but uh, um, I, I, I did this because all the products I've seen out there, a dog can tear them up. And I wanted something that physically you knew was safe. It wasn't running off 110 volts. And the dog couldn't, you know, all the heat pads I've seen, you know, dogs can be pretty destructive. Uh, I've got some igloos, for instance. That some of my dogs um, have igloos as well as their pens. And I've got one dog that will eat an igloo completely. It'll, in a year, it will have eaten that igloo where there's only half the igloos left. He, this is when you can see it's dirty. All of these are ones that are dirty. All of these are ones where I've had problems with the power cords, but all of these have, been, have worked really well until they tore the power cord up. And, right. and that's an uh, uh, indoor product, right? It's not... Well, no, you could use it outdoor. No, I mean, you absolutely, if you've got a dog that lives outside and he's got a kennel, I wouldn't leave it outside in the rain. But if you had a kennel and you could put, you know, one of these igloos, you could put this thing inside an igloo and have it nice inside there. So, and then, of course, the, uh, the adapter that, that the thing plugs into, you know, like, so it's got an adapter like this, that, of course, has got to be in a dry location. You can't, you can't leave that out in the rain, right? And, and, and also, 
you know, this thing is ultimately has got to plug into 110 volts. You've got to make sure the 110 volts cable is in a place where the dog can't get to it. Otherwise, you know, you could get a dog that's electrocuted. So, you know. Um, anyway, and that, you'd uh, put that underneath their blanket, or would you let them no, lay I just, on I, it? I just let them lay on it. They just love it. Uh, th here's the deal: if you've got a blanket out there, what my dogs do is they'll move the blanket around. They'll they'll get blankets between between them and tear them up. They'll start eating a blanket. They might get impacted with it. I don't put blankets in there very much. So then they like this. Anyway, enough of that. There we are. Got any questions, concerns, things that we can talk about, things we got wrong? Then uh, let us know, and uh, we will see you next week on the next video. Bye, everybody. This is where we need a theme song. Shall I sing it? Sure. <laughs> you can see by looking my, my my wife's glasses that I broke. She doesn't know about this yet. I'm going to get in trouble here a bit. Nobody tell her, please. Okay. Thanks for looking, everybody. Bye.